Yes, but, I mean, our media, uh, is any medium that strong that it can affect our lives and our whole outlook, Marshall? Uh, aren't media, as I think most of us feel, on the edges of life? Uh, they can be taken or left alone. Well, Alan, we've seen how print affected all aspects of our lives. Industry, education, the concept of the modern army, even. Our managerial class is a product of print culture. So is the idea of romantic love. The media are at the heart of our life because the media work through our senses. And print is a medium. Uh, it changed our sense makeup from what it had been in the Middle Ages. And now, certainly, these other media will do the same. They, the photo photo uh, photograph, movies, radio, TV, all these uh, change at once the way in which we see or hear or touch or feel ourselves and our world. A slight change in one of our five senses alters the ratio among the rest. People suddenly begin to want and appreciate different things. They begin to think differently. All right, but let's uh, get back to your earlier word, tribal, Marshal. Uh, why should all of this talk about media mean that individual man is on the way out and tribal man is on the way in? I mean, why is the big change taking place? To answer that, let's get back to Major, for he illustrates the changes brought about by media in the clearest way, especially if we contrast the teenager with his old-time contemporary, the adolescent. Whoa. <laughs> You mean there's a difference between the adolescent and the teenager? Yes, and I'd say it's the same kind of difference as that between book culture and the electronic era. The adolescent corresponds to the world of the book, the teenager to the electronic era. The adolescent is seeking self-definition, seeking to isolate his uniqueness from that of others, seeking to relate his self uh, to others. The adolescent knew he wasn't an adult. He knew he was in life's waiting room, that his life was not really real life. That would begin only with adulthood. The adolescent is still our image of what the young person should be. Well, now, what about uh, the future? Uh, I know you suggest that uh, we're always behind ourselves in realizing what's going on. One we're always living a way ahead of our thinking, yes. Uh, what about an educational procedure, then, which will... Uh, satisfy all of the senses that are now not being satisfied by youngsters in schools. It's Is the answer bigger schools, well, for example? No. And um, bigger uh, populations of school children uh, seem automatically to call for larger school spaces. But um, the sort of dialogue among all the elements of our world that is going on actually, and without benefit of um, bureaucratic blessing or unofficial blessing, the kind of exchanges and interchanges of imagery and awareness of peoples of the world. This is uh, the pattern, I think, that education will tend to resort to more and more. Instead of locating people, for, for example, in a particular space to teach them, say, German or Chinese, they will be moved to Germany or China to learn those things. By circuitry or physically? Physically. Or they could be uh, moved by circuitry. But as far as that goes, in our own world, we are hurrying back and forth across town at morning and night uh, to situations which we could quite easily encompass by closed circuit. Why do the wheels keep hurrying us downtown? Uh, some people are puzzled by this and have uh, come up with the answer. It's the filing cabinet downtown in the offices that makes it still necessary to rush back and forth from suburb to office. That it is this obsession with the contents of the file, documents, contracts, data. All of these materials actually could be just as available on closed circuit at home. The stockbroker long ago discovered this, that the telephone enables him to conduct his business anywhere. He doesn't have to hurry down to the stock exchange. So did the tycoon, like Paul Getty, who does most of his business by telephone. But we still have this obsessional, compulsive drive to fit into patterns, to fit into classifications, which says our job is down here. That's why we're terrified when automation uh, threatens to integrate us so that all the old fragmentary jobs go back into a circuit of wholeness. But is that inevitable? Uh, circuitry has already brought this about at many levels of our lives. And the uh, applying of it to the industrialized areas of fragment, fragmented and specialist tasks and work 
uh, is inevitable, yes, because it's already happening. You see, our marketing, for example, is way ahead of our production processes. As the speed it gets faster, it's, I suppose, as if all the members of an orchestra began to play a thousand times faster, but some only a hundred times faster. You would get a crazy pattern, wouldn't you, in a big orchestra? Tonight on Other Voices, Marshall McLuhan. Dr. McLuhan is director of the University of Toronto Center for Culture and Technology and the author of three controversial and highly regarded books on Western civilization, The Mechanical Bride, The Gutenberg Galaxy, and most recently, Understanding Media. Tonight, he is interviewed electronically by Other Voices producer Jim Guthrow, who talks into a camera in the control booth and is seen by Dr. McLuhan on a monitor on the studio floor.